Okay, so this is all from OPA and it says, okay, what's this about rationality? Uh, so it's talking about um, <clears throat> the choice of abstract goals and specific goals by a process of rational thought as against by an act of whim. So an unexamined emotion. Um, yeah. What, and I was just, this is, I, this is not really in the text, but I'm curious, what would you make it a, like, if I were to, if I were to tell you, okay, I chose, if I take this passage and I, I look at it and I say, okay, well, I chose my abstract values by a, a rational thought process. So I went through um, the possible values open to me and I methodically chose those that I thought were good. But then in terms of goals, they were based on unexamined emotions. Would do you think that's a what, what do you think of that? Well, this is for OPA, right? Yeah. Or okay. And I guess the chapter in rationality, I would guess. Um, um yeah, it is on on the good. Okay. okay. Um in that context, so I, mean, I think just by not choosing goals of just anything else besides the process of reason, like not even reflection on like you have a reaction to like i feel like my goal has to be for whatever reason like you don't just a reaction by emotion maybe without then analyzing it or without then thinking about it i think that's just all it's saying that sometimes it might just feel right like instead of acting on your gut as people say sometimes right when your gut could have some be a valid way but then you should at least by some way, double check it rather than relying on that on its own. Like assuming that you have the time to think about it. Like you have your, like you're sitting down deciding what am I, what kind of job should I accept? Like you were offered two jobs, which one do I take? That's when you might want to sit down and take a moment to um, evaluate the emotions you felt and compare them and things like that rather than just the mere reaction. Yeah. Okay. Um, in that in that example, what are your thoughts then of a decision making process that includes the gut, but um, it is within a a thoughtful framework? So, for example, because uh, I just read a book that was on this actually on uh, it was actually just interviews with uh, with a whole bunch of uh, wealthy people, and a lot of them said they make. A lot, a lot of decisions based on the gut, but within a framework yeah. of, you know, so they're not necessarily going to be able to analyze like why they feel a certain way. It's just, mm -hmm. that, let's say they're speaking to someone, there's a good product this person is selling. So it's a good person to go into business with. So it's, it's got a, um, a good market and uh, they decide not to because they didn't, they had a bad feeling about the person, but they weren't necessarily able to, you know, they're just, felt they didn't trust the person. And uh, a lot of them said they make their decision-making process based off that kind of analysis. Wait, I think it's fair to include that. Um, like we've talked about before, like intuitions can be appropriate. And yes, I think it's totally consistent with in the objectivist framework to make use of these emotions as far as like looking at them, thinking they're relevant information. They're not the final decider, but they're extremely important considerations. So I think that would be included within full context of one's knowledge, like recognizing what do I feel and the goals, like what other goals do you have to do? Like, does this one job conflict with another one? I mean, I think that's, in, well, as I just said, it, I think full context includes what emotions do you feel? Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that that's a good point. That makes sense. And do you think, um, in this passage to say, to mention both uh, values and goals, goals are, so once you've picked your values, they then constrain your goals. And so goals are the optional things I you mean, choose to pursue. Like there's a whole, you know, like I can say, all right, I value um, productivity, but then I, that, that means I can choose like 500 different lines of work, right? That's the goal. The goal, there's the value or the virtue or whatever you want. I don't know if it, let's just go with value. 
which is yeah. the abstract value. And then there's the goal is the specific option within that. Is that a, the right way to think about it? Yeah, I think when Picoff uses goal, I think he usually would mean like, yeah, the concrete thing you're going after, like the end you're trying to receive, like the mm -hmm. actual end in reality, where the end is a job or, or whatever, like winning a medal at the Olympics or something. Yeah. I'd say that would be the goal. And the abstract values could be like justice or honor or glory or things like that. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next passage. Ah, yeah. uh, this is about, um, so it talks about honesty and it, it gives an example of, well, it, it actually breaks up honesty into different, the different aspects. So there's like intellectual honesty. Uh, there's the aspect of honesty in method, in motive and, and in content. And this one, and, and then it explains what, what each means. And so in method, it says, I don't really, by the way, I don't really get this thing I'm going to make red. I don't really get what that is, knowing what one does know. I would have thought that's knowing what one does not know. But anyway, um, basically, it's a policy. Let's just say, yeah, here we go, a policy of integration. But then it says... If you default on the responsibility of it, of the on the, um, on this responsibility, whether through stagnation or evasion, that's a form of pretense. But I don't, I don't, I don't get why stagnate. Like stagnation is a uh, is, is to me is very different from evasion. It's like just non it's let's say passivity so why why is it why is it describing it as faking the pursuit of knowledge okay so you agree about the evasion part like that yeah. would be, so let's well consider the... even actually you know what even even with evasion like what is being i don't get what's being faked here like i don't see anything being faked someone could evade and i don't see why they're faking the pursuit of knowledge. He's not pursuing knowledge. And pursuing. also, what's your opinion on this part that I've, I've just changed to red? What does it mean? Wait, knowing... I, think it, I think it means the same as knowing what you don't know. Knowing what you know is the, I don't know why she necessarily phrased it. Oh, okay. The positive, but it seems to mean the same thing. Knowing like, what you know. but. Okay, what, what does it mean to know what I know? It's more like a metacognition, like a recognizing, like being honest to yourself. I do, in fact, know these facts. I'm not going to pretend I know. Yeah. Like as far as being intellectually honest, it is showing that you know what you know it's true, but being willing to say you don't know for, for what you don't know. Like being able, almost like Socrates, uh, to the, <clears throat> okay yeah i get it i so it would be like it, it would be like uh if you went into the if you went back to the apology and all of those books with socrates in them and he went around asking people what does this mean they would just say i don't know that's what knowing what you know is like being aware of the fact that yeah, you might only aware. have a few examples in mind but you don't but you haven't thought through what the concept is. And so it's awareness of the, the a level of self-awareness for which concepts yes. do I understand and which do I not understand, or which actually, which do I, um, which do I grasp and which do I not grasp, which is, a, I guess that would be a skill, right? Yeah. I think it'd be partly a skill. Yeah. Cause you okay. have to take that time to reflect on the mm -hmm. facts and knowing like, do I in fact remember what the truth is about this? Or like if you're having an argument, sometimes it could be, um, it might feel right to avoid the fact that somebody asks you a question and then it, your argument is then weakened. You might want to say, well, might react in a way that as if you know, but you might admit, well, like you're right, I don't know the truth about that fact. I can't, I have no counter argument because, right. because I don't know the relevant facts, things like that. Um, 
So we need to fault on that responsibility. And your policy is non-integration, like a willful non, like willfully not looking. Well, there's a designation. I don't know what is policy. It's preserved knowledge. I, mean, I guess we could say that if you have no policy of integration, like you have utterly no policy of thought, like you're not even trying to fake a pursuit of knowledge, you're just not pursuing it, period. So I'm not sure what he means, like, but faking its pursuit. I mean, if you're stagnating, you're not pursuing anything, I would say, that you're not even trying to, to right. fake it. That's what I thought, yeah. I mean, I understand people, sometimes if you then try to say win an argument or complete a, complete a discussion or insist that you know when you in fact don't, I mean, that would be faking your pursuit of knowledge, like acting as if you're trying to, acting as if the truth is, in fact, the value you're seeking. Rather, you would actually be seeking some social, like higher, you're seeking a secondhandness, mm -hmm. that social metaphysics we talked about, where you're trying to, where you're making the value of the, how people look at you as more important than the value of truth. Mm -hmm. But I would say if they're stagnating, I would say that they're not pursuing anything, right. which is bad for other reasons, obviously, but I wouldn't say it's because he's faking Me neither. the pursuit. But it would still qualify as like dishonesty because you know because honesty takes a is an active thing. It's not you can't act you can't passively be honest. Oh uh, really? Because, yeah, I think that's the implication here. That you have to recognize what you know or not know not only that you have to actually ah oh, and that's a constant it. and you're okay i get yes. it so and so that's a constant active process where i'm like do i actually yes. get this or not yes okay including the expanding your knowledge I mean, not only is it to understand what you know but then seek to grow that knowledge and that's always active so that's why it's saying <clears throat> being intellectually honest means an active mind All right Okay, and then why is, so why is constantly expanding one's knowledge considered part of that? I would say because, well, you're constantly faced with new situations, new people, new information, plus you're trying to live as effectively as you can. So when you see something in the world that affects you, like anything new that happened or new values or seeking values, you have to recognize in what way the impact your life, recognizing like in what way that it might help improve your life. I, like I would think like an example, like technology, how does new technology improve your life? And that would include like integrating that knowledge or the whole approach to understanding the truth of things. And I think it's more the, the practical value of it that you can apply it to your life or make use of it in your life. I think that's usually what Rand would mean by the value of knowledge. Okay. Um, I'm, one thing I'm, I'm, I realized I'm not that clear on is like, I don't get how you go from, I, I can see how you might say, well, you can observe that man's basic, mean of, basic means of survival is reason, but then how you go from that to like almost it does seem a bit deductive to then just invent all these like virtue. I, 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 it's not clear to me that it, it's, it's from observations that you, from observations that you then get to, um, you know, like these six, you're like, oh, here are six virtues based on, I, I don't know what, but it, yeah, it, it does seem a bit uh, deductive. Like it's not that clear to me how you get these specifically from observation. The um, way I've seen Rand argue about it, usually haven't seen very many examples either. So it's hard for me to say was to what degree was she being overly deductive in coming up with these. Yeah. But I do agree with it as far as observations and that I made it things like that. But but that's why I think it helped me a lot to have supplemental stuff about this. Because Rand alone seemed to be a bit incomplete for an explanation for me. Right. Other than her fiction, 
Her fiction yeah. was great for that. But as far as an argument or a philosophical explanation, I've done better with Opar and other books or even Aristotle the Smith book. Oh, Aristotle okay. too. Tara Smith. But Aristotle a bit too. But all those uh, secondary stuff, I think that yeah. would be more to understand what virtue is and what it should be. Okay. Um, all right. By the way, look, I'm going to read you this from Gout speech, which is another example of why this whole thing can seem so deductive. Yeah. Um, where is it? Oh, here we go. I think I found it. Uh, Uh, I, I can't find it. I don't want to spend too long on it, but it was basically something like, um, you know, existence exists and the act of grasping that contains everything else. But there was some passage like that in the speech. And yeah. so that's, um, that, that seems, I can see why that just seems so deductive, but. I mean, it's fine to have those deductive arguments sometimes because it demonstrates the soundness of the argument and why these premises fit together in such a way. So at least it can, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so quick to say like their argument is just deductive. I mean, you need those deductive arguments as well to make sure it's valid, to make sure it reduces to reality, to make sure it's consistent, that sort of thing. Right. Okay. I didn't, I didn't think about that before. So that yeah. It's a indicator of consistency. And then the question is, yeah. Have there been observations the, that justify it? Yes, yeah, where where did the premises come from? It's less about like that argument, but where like yes, you need the, the deduction to be appropriate, but you also need to make sure that premises are based on something real. Like the okay. usual argument, do you say if you say claim the I can't think of an example? You can say cheese has holes, the moon has holes. Therefore, the moon is made of cheese, which is I mean, it's a sound argument, but obviously the premise is ridiculous. Or like that the having of holes is not just what makes something cheese or not, things like that. But it could be a valid thing too. Like, obviously, like the whole Socrates is a man, that whole syllogism. I mean, that, of course, that's absolutely true. And the premise makes sense why he, Socrates is moral or why he's a man. I want to ask you something else here as well, related to this. Yeah. Okay, so this is about Aristotle's um, formulation of A is A. Yeah. And I'm quoting, has stated the formula defining the concept of existence and the rule of all knowledge, A is A, a thing is itself. You have never grasped the meaning of his statement. I'm here to complete it. Existence is identity. Consciousness is identification. Well, I don't, I don't get what the significance of that is. Like, um, yeah, I, I just don't really. Do, do you have thoughts on that? Um, going from A is A, even when, you, even when you look at his statement of A is A, it just seems so like, um, it's hard to see you know, like make a connection between A is A and let's say someone following a duty-based ethics. Like it's it's just not, you don't see the A is A in anything. You know what I'm saying? Like you can see yeah. the A is A on paper in the abstract, but to see it in, um, yeah, uh, um, I have trouble with seeing because it it's so abstract. But any thoughts on one, A is A and its abstractness and two, on this idea of completing um, it, grasping the meaning of that statement and it's and completing it with existence is identity and consciousness is identification. Okay, so first the A is A. You mean like Aristotle's construction or the way yeah. he thought of it? 
Yeah. Okay. So I mean, if for one, that's a abstract statement of logic, just in the way it's stated, because you abstract away the content of the premise to be just A, and to say that A is always itself in the same respect in the same way. So I mean, that alone is just the abstraction into logic and into a logical form where you don't need to say and like an apple is an apple. Oh, okay. Or, yeah. Or a tree is a tree because yep. you've abstracted away the content. Now you just have the premise just as A or the, the, the variable is just A. I mean, that part is kind of what I think Aristotle did to develop logic. I mean, is that recognition they could abstract away the details of the premises and arguments. Right. And just leave the pieces of it. So it's like that a... was an advancement. Well, it's an advancement from say Heraclitus and Parmenides and Thales and all that who came before and advancement over Plato who didn't have that conception either. So it's and they understood it's, arguments, but yeah. It's the condensation of a of a particular form of argument which is valid. A is A. Is that would that be a right take on it? Um something like that where he can abstract something, like abstract arguments we make that define a commonality among, say, all arguments or all positions or how facts hold together. I mean, he could abstract away the particular details. Right. So when we talk about the nature of, say, horses and the nature of plants and the nature of rocks, there could be some way to, or, or to analyze their nature yep. in common among all those things. Okay. Which is an advancement from like, Heraclitus, who didn't have any particular rule of why things change in a particular way, just that some all things change in all different ways. There's mm -hmm. no consistency. Or Parmenides trying to argue that everything is just the same because then nothing would make sense. So everything has to be the same. But it doesn't really distinguish between the way something could be something what it is, or the ways that something has an identity, because they can only look at the concrete things like you see what a thing is and it should stay that because then, then you understand what it is. But when you add and change and all that, that's when people lose things. And I guess Aristotle introducing logic would give us a way to think about it in a cohesive way rather than just like, co like all fragmented. Yep. And then the formulation of Existence is identity, consciousness is identification. What what is that? Um, like, why is that meaning meaningful? And why is the meaning of like? How, I don't get. How, how do you get from A is A to that? What do you mean? Like how? Yeah, like how do you okay. Get there? Well, yeah. Let me just find. See if I can find this passage again. Um, okay. So this, the greatest philosopher has stated the formula defining a concept of existence and the rule of all knowledge, uh, A is A. Uh, so that's the concept of existence. I get that it's the rule of all knowledge, but concept of existence, I'm not sure. And then it says, a thing is itself. You've never grasped the meaning of his statement. I'm here to complete it. Existence is identity, consciousness is identification. I think it's trying to complete it in the sense I'm completing that statement. It's hard to understand what that means to, to complete it. I mean, I know Rand thinks it's valuable to integrate those ideas. I don't think anybody's really often integrated as your conscience is the same as identification. I'm not really sure actually what she would mean by to complete it. Okay. Um, was that in God's speech? Yeah, it was. Me? Yeah, I'm, I'm just reading yeah. from that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. I'll review it. I'm, I'm going over it. So we'll yeah. come back to it. I'll copy paste stuff. Yeah. About Aristotle, um, I, I did read, I've started reading just. Uh, uh, like a little introductory pamphlet that was on, I forget, some philosophy site, but I've just got some random questions before I go any further. He Apparently, he also said man is a political animal because he yes. depends on his wife, his children, 
you need slaves to survive. What's all that about? Because wasn't it, I thought his formulation was man is a rational animal, and so, but he's also saying he's a political animal. It was that a quote or was that a- It wasn't a quote. It was from that little booklet that it was okay. just, the, that's what the little booklet that I read okay. mentioned. It didn't focus on okay. man is rational. It just focused on that he's a political um, animal because of his relationships. I don't quite remember how that that went. I do know. Yeah. Okay. That a large part of it was to be political because like, I, mean, I think it was like he's. It implies that he's a political animal, but I'm not sure because I didn't read politics. The one right after Nicomachean ethics, but I do know he thought it was fundamental to our nature that we had to live in a political sort of environment political being our society how do we get along and how do we like have our selves work together right all right well i will uh, come back to that later but uh the next thing is it there was something about how he when he formulated his ethics he observed the beggars the lepers the slaves uh who inhabited this is a copy paste the alleyways of athens and they, they never spoke of happiness but the educated and the affluent, affluent Athenians, um, you know, did speak about their discontent. Oh, he heard constant complaints from the educated and uh, educated and affluent Athenians about yeah. their discontent. And I, I remember asking you about this ages ago, but I wanted to know what's the, you know, the, the take on the problem of um, when you get what you want, then you're disappointed because you don't get the expected payoff, which is what Aristotle was. I mean, I keep seeing this come up over and over again, but I don't remember what the, I don't know if there's some unique formulation in objectivism in regard to that. You know what I'm saying? I like, think of, I can't think the, of any unique take, like okay. my take, but I don't yeah, know. What, the, okay, what's my yours? My take would be, let's say, they get what they want, but they're disappointed. I think it's usually have to do with they hadn't set a long-term goal that once they achieve it's like what now where do i go now and they feel disappointed or like what was the point of that because now it's like you get something and like you attain your life goal like so your goal was to get olympic medal for 200 yard dash and yeah. you get it and you wouldn't feel disappointed as much as like well now i can move on to this if you can't define what you want to move on to or you don't know what goal you have next then I could see you get stuck at it sad or disappointed okay. or rationalize it or become depressed even. And um, they can ask you. But then are you, are you saying it's you need an open ended goal, like a never ending yeah, thing? Like, that... Well, life is an implicit thing I'm saying here that, but you should recognize that, but then also set those sub goals to connect where you are now to your life in the long term you can't just have a bunch of goals and just say there's there's life the gold medal that's it like you get the gold medal then what then it just seems like a floating thing like you need to make it a pro constant project in a way that like what is that goal of getting the gold medal is that part of something else like is that part of some other self-development thing things like that the way to expand those goals to last a long-term way and i think that, that would that would eliminate this problem um so you, you're saying it should be part of some open-ended thing then like get this medal because you know like um yeah i'm not i don't know uh about open-ended goals because then you you could you never achieve it right yeah, but but in a way, like well, life is still your flourishing is still the goal, and in a way, you never achieve it because it's always there, it's always going. Right, you always have to like, be actively pursuing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be difficult. I'm sure. Sometimes you might find periods that it's hard to find that consistent point to doing things. Yeah. But I think. Yeah, you don't want it completely open-ended because then it's like nothing seems concrete and it can go anywhere in any which way so right at least like the balance between the definite goals from with the 
long-term goals. Mm -hmm. You have to integrate the two of them, I guess. Go at it from both sides. What about, um, I was just curious if the, the, the principle of the razor and naming your primaries, do you ever use that day to day? Because I, I can't think of a time when I, I wouldn't even know in a given situation what it means to name my primaries. I don't really think of it in those terms. Okay. I don't say like I'm using the razor. I don't really use it much. Okay. I mean, Peacock came up with it. And I oh, right, right, right. Yeah. It wasn't okay. even ran his own thing. So I guess even being able to identify what the primaries are is difficult because I can't, I won't necessarily yeah. be able to do that. Um, okay. Next thing is certainty. We can, we may, we've touched on this before, so maybe we can, if it's like, we don't, we might not, you might not know. And okay. uh, I'm definitely going to revisit this again. So it's okay if we skip through it. Um, okay. An example of, you know, how there was that big ship that got stuck in the Suez yeah. Canal is that yeah. if I was sitting, uh, like, let's say I was running some hedge fund and would it have been arbitrary for me to consider, oh, maybe a ship will get stuck and block the Suez Canal. But then if I use this epistemology, um, wouldn't I have said, oh, it's, um, ships have a capacity to do it, but um, it's, there's no evidence. So therefore don't think about it. Like, is there, is there, um, cause it happened, right? Like it, it can yeah, happen. It and then so, but before, would it have been arbitrary for me to say, it can happen, let me plan for it? Well, I guess without, kinda, without more like concrete details of the example of the, and the person like, who's Do you mean the, the person that owns the company? The company? Yeah, yeah, let's just or go with that, the person who owns the company, yeah. Or a hedge fund manager the, or something like that. Or the company that, that owned the ship that got stuck or somebody uh, owning a ship? It can be anything you can pick. So it can be the person who owns the, the ships or it could be a hedge fund manager who's like looking at okay. global risks. Um, yeah, like the, uh, even take the hedge fund manager, right? He doesn't have access necessarily yeah. to like details of how does a ship get stuck or anything like that. He's just, yeah. well, this is a narrow canal. Is it, it could be possible for, it's metaphysically possible for a ship to get stuck, but is it yeah. epistemologically impossible and arbitrary or is it would one consider it or not well i'll take it in pieces yeah well, let's start with just the that you own the evergreen ship yeah i mean the company evergreen i forget what the name of the ship was but anyway so you're the garbage owner we can the call company. it garbage green yeah garbage green there you let's go. just say the owner of that ship it wouldn't be arbitrary to think will i get stuck because i think you're trying to I mean, you're the ship itself. You're the one observing of you. You're, well, are you driving it correctly? Doesn't seem arbitrary to consider, will I get stuck? Because that's the whole point of being, driving it in through a canal. Right. Preventing it from being stuck. So right. It's like the point of it. So that maybe is very realistic. Uh-huh. Or let's say you're operating the canal. You see a ship coming in. You can just guess it's going to get stuck. Well, again, it's like that. We were just talking about yeah, like, your job is to get it through. And if you fail, it gets stuck. I mean, the whole point of your job is to prevent it from getting stuck. Right. But then Okay, so it wouldn't be arbitrary. You'd be like, uh, well, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess from an outsider's perspective, though, like without knowledge of the. Yeah. Of the but let's uh, say you're the hedge fund manager and you own a shipping company and they're sending a ship through the Suez Canal. In a way, you could assume that it's arbitrary to assume that it'll get stuck. Unless you have reason to think that, like, well, your boat drivers are incompetent, things like that. Or you might think that you know, there's political chaos in Egypt. So you might worry about shipments not getting through the canal. Um, but as far as will this, will a random boat get stuck today? It doesn't seem relevant to your considerations unless you had some reason like those general things you would know about a canal whether they apply or not like peacock mentioned about the airplane like i mean if you saw the the uh, say the pilot drinking 
like two martinis with, in the airport bar just before the flight, then it's like, well, this is not safe. Well, it might crash today. Then it wouldn't be arbitrary. Right. But without anything like that, there's no reason to say, oh, it's going to, it might crash today. It's, I mean, there's no basis to say it might, but. I you guess could you could have. investigate it, right? Like you yeah. could, you could probably go, yeah. are there statistics? If it is an unknown. Yeah. Well, uh, well, okay. You could say it's metaphysically possible and then you'd investigate, okay. Are there statistics, right? You could do that. I, yeah. I couldn't, I just tried searching it now. I couldn't find any because statistics yeah, are the guide to knowledge when you don't have knowledge. Yeah. yeah I think this is the most arbitrary thing, but when it be like truly like not even like truly beyond the pale, like what if a meteor hits a, the canal and blows it up today? Like yeah. that would be more absurd. Okay. Like, it might be worth not just worrying always so much. Is it arbitrary? But is there any basis with which you should go forward on this okay. idea? And okay. Sometimes you can just use stats and that's plenty fine. Would you agree with me? So I don't know if you remember this, the tunnel is dangerous example. When I was telling you the story of my friend and she was like avoiding going under the tunnel because it looked scary and it was at yeah. night. And I was like, do you think that, would I be correct to say that if someone is, let's say, so she's walking back from work and there's an empty tunnel and she's seen in movies that, uh, I don't know, criminals um, attack people in tunnels or she's seen, she's heard something about criminals liking to perpetrate crimes in places where they can't be witnessed. Is she using a form of statistics then to make that decision? You know, it's not a big sample size, but it's like, if you've read criminals have wherever that information was got from uh criminals prefer to perpetrate crimes in places where there's no um you know witnesses then and then she avoids walking under the tunnel is that her using a form of statistics as far as i would judge yeah yeah okay that would be a fair judgment because that's the safety of your life it's not like it's not so much arbitrary because it's trying to make some inference about safety in a very I think that would be very scary if it happened. Yeah. I guess not. Um, I want to emphasize, though, that the whole idea about arbitrary specifically, the way that Peacock really distinguishes is really just a Peacock thing. He tried to expand on Randman, the way she talks about evidence, and sometimes she uses the word arbitrary. But okay. it's not a principle that she came up with. It's, right. She used the word sometimes, and Peacock is taking it to a deeper level, he's trying to make a philosophical case that it's a category of knowing. And right away, that's not even knowing. But sometimes it's hard to always justify everything on that argument. And you can't always use Rand's words to justify it because it's Peacock's own take. But I think it's a fair take. But I think you just got to be careful how you use it. I, mean, I don't think you just say there's just things are arbitrary. It's just. You have to take the case, what, like what kind of case is it? Like, and what position you are in the situation, like comparing, are you the driver of the boat or are you the hedge fund manager that owns the boat that can't really see anything going on okay. at the canal? Like, like what level are you at in relation okay. to the consideration, the hypothetical? Um, and then let's say you're in India and you, you want to get on a truck um, and to say it's risky, it's some kind of, it's some kind of uh, I mean, statistical judgment, right? Because it's like, it's not certain. Yeah. Um, and well, I don't know, what is that? Like, you're not, you're just looking at the truck, you see like, okay, it's, it doesn't, it's very heavy as in it's, it's, there's tons of people on this truck. Like it's the, the roads aren't that good that evaluation when you're saying this is risky um that's like you're looking at if i want to translate it into the terms of this these principles is that me saying okay it's metaphysically uh is it well it's metaphysically possible but then you're saying there's evidence that the, the evidence is what you observe like the bad quality road there's some evidence yeah. 
that um, epistemologically that this could go badly. Um, I think so. But then is that a, you know, you're not, you're not saying this will happen. You're saying this, is that a, I don't get, is that a statistical judgment? Cause you're, you're not dealing in um, this will, this X or Y will happen. It's just, this might happen. There's some evidence for it. I think with anything with the risk, there will always be a might. It can never be like, well, then it wouldn't be a risk anymore. It'd just be right, right, right. definite thing. But they don't exist metaphysically, right? It's, it's more our lack of knowledge about conditions and factors that. Yes, um, for risk, for a thing like that, you can't. It's hard to judge like the safety of a, of a truck. So you do, yeah, it would be reasonable to use evidence you do know about safety. Like say, are there seat belts or right. how bad are the roads? Is there any license to driving? Are drivers generally careful in India? Things like that. Right. Um... I'm just trying to work out where statistics come in, comes into this, if at all. Like, well, I guess if you had access to statistics, you you might. Yeah, you might it, just don't be able to. But do general stuff, just like it's more safe if there's less bumps. It's more safe when there's fewer people. It's more safe if you have a seatbelt. Not in absolute terms, like it's fifty percent safer or anything like that. There's a one in. 300 chance or something i don't okay. think you go to that level of detail but it would still be statistical but okay or i forget what that, i think that's called i forget what kind of logic or logical reasoning that's called but anyway it's using sometimes and maybe and some to make judgments okay um he said in the lecture on certainty that statistics is not what knowledge it's someone something might turn into knowledge. Possibility is not knowledge. Certainty is knowledge. Probability is a hypothesis. He said that statistics yeah. is relations between unknowns. Can you help me break down what that means? Like, what does it mean statistic is not knowledge? Like, if I say, going back to this uh, truck example, wherever it is, if it's in Russia or Africa, um, like, aren't I, if I'm... Um, you know, if I, if I know that, um, okay, let's say there are 10% of trucks crash, isn't that a form of knowledge? I, I don't see why it's, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just not getting what, what he means by it's not knowledge. My charitable interpretation, which I don't really like the wording myself either. My charitable interpretation would be that he's trying to say knowledge as in the things you can attain. Knowledge um, in the things you can attain. And I'm, I'm still trying to think it out. Things you're trying to. Because he mentioned it for research too. He said, it's not like in the social sciences, let's say they heavily rely on statistics, but he said, that's not knowledge. It might turn into knowledge, but it's that I don't, I just, I couldn't quite get my head around what that means. I would interpret that he's trying to say that in this case, you would only have knowledge if you know the state of the world as it is not as it might be as it is not only... as it... but, the but i don't really like that either yeah okay yeah i know i don't like it either i mean i don't think he's trying to just say that it's not like you don't know when you know that's a 10 percent risk I, mean, I don't understand why it would be that it's not knowledge it's knowledge of the possibility or you could distinguish between dispositioned or possibilities as facts and reality as knowledge. And you could distinguish that from the way things are at this moment. I mean, there's a difference between the two. It's not like it's not relevant to know that there's at some portion of the time that there's car accidents and there's not. Right. I mean, to me, that would be knowledge. It's just not knowledge in, the, in terms of knowing for certain what will be I mean, it's relevant because like, you know, that trees can either fail to grow or they become saplings. I mean, it's not like, it's not knowledge to know that. And you could say that like, I don't know, 80% of trees become saplings. The rest don't make it. I mean, yeah, that's statistical in that sense that 
whether or not they could be isn't really knowledge. Like, take this particular tree, will it, will it make it through it? Well, it's hard to say, but you know for sure that it either will become a sapling or it dies. There's no other options. Or, or just, just to simplify it, those could say those are his options. That would be knowledge. Okay. Um, we'll have to come back to this one too. The in the in the same lecture he said, oh, actually this was in the lecture of, of principles. He said one should plan ahead to allow for unseen unforeseen contingencies. As in that was his formulation of like he was just trying to explain how do you go from I got on a train it was late and so formulating a principle wouldn't be come to the train early it would be something like one should plan that would be an example of a principle so he, he just gave that as an example of a principle so unrelated to this part uncertainty but then um you know if, if you drew if you um came up with this principle let's say isn't that an example of acting on the arbitrary according to this like which doesn't make sense i know it doesn't make sense i'm just trying to see how uh, i'm trying to more clearly understand this concept because if I'm saying one should plan ahead to allow for unforeseen con contingencies, aren't I saying, well, I'm now planning for the metaphysically possible, but the epistemologically impossible, or is that not? Um, I think peak up isn't clear enough what he means about arbitrary, unfortunately, but I okay. do think that unforeseen contingencies could be along the lines of what I was saying, that like, if you own the hedge fund, there might be a point where it's reasonable to know that like unforeseen contingency just, I mean, you know that canals can break down or things can happen. Right. You could just allow that it could happen. Right. And you recognize that there are things that need to be taken care of. Right. But it's not totally arbitrary to think that somebody's going to screw up someday. I mean, you could allow for the contingency without make it part of your, that anything that happens wouldn't really affect things. But even as far as those contingencies, you don't consider like meteorites hitting the canal as part of any contingency whatsoever. But why not? If you're, if you're, I know this sounds ridiculous, but if I'm going with this, my, at least my understanding of it, which, which is why I'm asking it, because it doesn't make sense to me. If I'm saying allow for unforeseen contingencies, aren't I saying, um, you know, that example you just gave of like, oh, well, then you can think of everything. Like what, what is the, if, if I'm trying to use the language from these principles and I'm saying uh, allow for unforeseen contingencies, which means you consider things that are epistemologically impossible, but metaphysically possible, doesn't that mean I should be, which is doesn't sound right to me, I know, but doesn't that mean if I'm following the logic of my own understanding of this, doesn't that mean that ah oh, suddenly I should be thinking about meteorites and all this crazy stuff that doesn't make sense? The answer I want to give it, it's hard to give a good answer here. Yeah, okay. I think the best I can give is that that you have to consider the well different like what kind of unforeseen things are you trying to include? I mean. The known unknowns seem appropriate, but the unknown unknowns like that meteorite, it doesn't seem like that could be even part of an unforeseen contingency. Okay. I mean, I know like you're thinking of it by saying there's a meteorite, but it seems like in that category of stuff that seem not only is it not even a consideration, it doesn't, it just doesn't happen. I mean, it okay. could in some universe, but it's not even worth thinking about, but it's that be, I don't know, it just doesn't lead anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's no basis to even think about it and no way okay. to demonstrate that it will happen. Okay. All Why right, do you let's... bold that part? Hypothetical deductive. Sorry? Why do you bold that part? Hypothetical deductive. Oh, I was going to ask you a different question. I bolded it oh, because I, I just came up with it now, but we can. Okay. Uh... Sure. Uh, actually, I'll ask you now before I go into the next thing. Yeah. So remember you you explained to me this this hypothetical deductive method and you gave yes. me the example of these trees. Yeah. And 
um, and some kind of Japanese virus. But yeah. uh, in that case, in the in the example of using this hypothetical deductive, one thing I don't understand is that if I find, let's say, um, the cause, which is what did you say, some kind of Japanese insect, beetle. A, beetle. a beetle, okay, a Japanese beetle, you found yeah. it, all right, you're like, so then th the hypothesis is um, still unproven. Is that what the status is? Um, it it's not disproven against... or you've, cause you, you can only disprove, but the, it remains unproven, right? Well, one thing you could, yeah, would you have to do an experiment at least to do that? Yeah. Let, let's say you have, you've released these Japanese okay. beetles and they've destroyed trees again. And you're like, so the status of that hypothesis is unproven. Um, According to the hypothetical deductive, you can't prove that it's true. You can only demonstrate that it's false. Okay. So then, so it just remain the status remains the same, right? It remains unproven, even though you essentially, can. but that's bizarre because then the, you're saying that you've tested like at least, uh, it, it doesn't then differentiate like... between like you've released Japanese beetles and you found they do affect, they kill the trees. And you're saying, well, if I, um, you know, if I play disco music at night, that has the same status as me releasing Japanese beetles, which I've tested. Both are unproven. Like to me, that's, I don't, I don't get that. You might do it, reason about it. Like which one seems more reasonable or okay. other evidence you have based on other experiments and things like that. When, and if you go hardcore, hypothetical deductive, then yeah, you wouldn't end up anything. And okay. that's why it's more like a, when you go like all into it, like that's the only way you can do science. Like Popper might have you think then, okay. then yeah, you can never really attain a certainty. You can have anyway, like best guesses, but or science is more like, but this is not really how science does work. Yeah, they do hypothetical deductive partially, but it's not all you do in science. Okay. That actual scientists do a lot more and that the objective is argument would be that it's primarily inductive that sure we might do that hypothetical deductive sometimes but primarily getting at these truths like how do you know for sure that how do you argue then that it was the beetles that did cause it not just that it was a reasonable um, hypothesis, but to demonstrate it was the Beatles rather than say the the rainfall or something else. Yeah, we need induction as some way to show that it was these Beatles uniquely rather than something else. Okay, and that's you... need induction to like demonstrate what these Beatles do, or how you know that these Beatles always cause this, and not that it was a fluke or something, things like that. Have you read David Deutsch's Beginning of Infinity? No. No, okay. All right, let me, before we go on, I wanna, well, I mean, we're running out of time, but let me ask you about the, your plan for this. Um, what, what were you thinking so far in terms of developing your, your general coursework? Because uh, I got a few ideas. So what, what are you, you just so, general, yeah. A psychoepistemology course, which would be, <laughs> helping your like techniques of using your subconscious that's the best wording of right now but those thinking skills like like how you focus your mind how you access the information you need when you need it how you get your mind to by habit be on the looking and focusing on the world around you yep and also the things to like all those thinking skills that the more how to of thinking skills, like, you know, you should be rational. You know that you shouldn't rely on your emotion to make decisions with, and you should focus, but this is more like the how, like, like, what does that mean to do? Right, right, you right. Know, but how? So I want to go more into the how. Okay. Which would be a combination of philosophy and my psychology background. So we could do, um, 
like obviously we've had a lot of sessions, but it could be like a, I could be tested on, I, you could test it on me. And then if I, like, let's say I set wider goals of what I want to do and apply it to, and then we can go through, you could yeah. test it on me. And then if yeah. I've, you know, if like I'm managing to apply it and I, I'm seeing a difference in some yeah. little things I have, but it's so far been a struggle, yeah. let's say in, in things we've done, then I will uh, help you advertise it. We could do something yeah. like that. Yeah, I was thinking along those lines. Yeah, cool. I'm going to, I'm still waiting to move into a, a different place, but I'm definitely going to go through all this. I think I've gone through yeah. like compilers and mental models, see if I can like get yeah. practice in applying them to different situations. Yes. All that, so we can discuss all that too. Yeah. But I'm working on a couple of things and then maybe some overlap in terms of like yeah. um, selling this course and finding platforms to sell it for you. So yeah, what got me thinking about it was, I was like the Ben Zwanger's thing. Let me, hold on a second. Let me, 